I would like to thank uh, Father Andrew and all of the people here at St. Matthew's for sponsoring the lectures and you have come from the different area churches. My name is Bishop Anthony. I went to school with Father Alexander Garklaus and Carol, his wife, is my best friend there. <laughs> and uh, we graduated together as co-valedictorians of our graduating class in 1982. So we both gave speeches. <laughs> and we've been giving speeches ever since. So it's, it's wonderful to see him and it, it, have those great memories and nourishing memories for me. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. John Maddox and Ancient Faith Ministries for being here to record these lectures and for all the good work they have done over these many years. It's been a great blessing to have Ancient Faith Ministries uh, to spread orthodoxy in, to this American culture. Because as Father Hopko said, unless a culture is baptized, it cannot really reveal the kingdom of God in the, in the area it lives in. So there can be Greek Orthodoxy and Russian Orthodoxy and Middle Eastern Orthodoxy, but there must be an American flavor and context of Orthodoxy. And so it will develop over time just in the fact that we're coming together. My topic is on eschatology or the apocalypse. I won't be going by, uh, verse by verse through the book of Revelations. I'll just do a systematic topical presentation over these lectures. So I'll do an introduction. I'll talk about how the end times is really always with us in the divine liturgy. Then I'll go through apocalypsis itself, what it means. And then mankind at the end of time and the great apostasy and so-called great tribulation, which is mentioned in the 24th chapter and the 13th chapter, 24th chapter of St. Matthew, the 13th chapter of St. Mark, the 17th and the 21st chapter of St. Luke, and many other areas in the New Testament. So there's a lot of literature, which is almost a genre, in the New Testament about the end times itself. When we went to seminary, specific historical reference to the end times was hardly ever given a major emphasis, as you remember, Father. We mostly concentrated on the kingdom of God present all the time, especially in the divine services. So I will go through both of those to give a balanced presentation of the whole view of orthodoxy towards the end times. Eschatology is a Greek word that means uh, the study of the last things. When one hears or talks about the end times, that's what we're talking about. It is a very broad subject. It is very complex and intricate. It can be bewildering. There are snarled conclusions, I say, disconnected fragments of theology. There, is, there are visions and there are visual presentations that don't seem to match, have no systematic order at all. They even seem to be interruptions in the narrative itself. So I'm going to try to piece it together. I don't know if they do crossword puzzles anymore, but in a sense, it's a crossword puzzle. And you have to put all the pieces together in their right order. Otherwise, you get the wrong picture of things. Many times, people will interpret it according to what they think it is in different Christian groups and communities. People are fascinated by the end times because there's a sense that things are winding down. But every generation has a sense that things are winding down. In the days of Hammurabi and the ancient Babylonians, there's an old scripture, uh, there was an old uh, a piece of writing that was discovered. They said, the youth have no sense of order. They don't honor their parents. All, everything is falling apart in the year 1839 B.C. So, <laughs> you see that these things are very common with people looking at it from their own perspective, so we don't want to get too carried away. But on the other hand, in the church, we always look at history as linear. lineal. It starts and it ends. It goes in a line. It's not a circle of a never-ending recurrence and return of all things, which was more of a Greek philosophical concept of human destiny. 
and human origins. That, especially in Platonism and Neoplatonism, uh, each person is a part of God. So the body is a mere container. It has not really the, uh, a, a, a complexity of body and soul and interdependence of them. It's the soul is, needs to be liberated from the body and return to its very beginning, which is to be in God, the O'on, the one who is. So the purpose of life is to be lost in the great expanse of divinity, not to find yourself as a unique person who cooperates with God and expresses him uniquely, eternally with God, to be all by grace that the Son is by nature. That's an orthodox, a church concept. And it is linear. It means we have a start and we have a finish. So as each of us has our own end times coming up, there is a historical end time. There's a beginning of Christianity and there is a winding down of it and that's what we'll be examining. So if scientific knowledge examines concrete and material things and even that is complex and difficult to understand, our church teaches us that the knowledge of a spiritual and mystical kind is even more dependent upon the purity of hearts of those who study it. So when we study the end times, it's not just a technical, scientific, academic, or intellectual study. It includes a spiritual discipline within the church with its sacraments and its saints and its practices. So the more you're growing in Christ, in the Holy Spirit, through the Son, for the Father, the more you understand the times you live in. A great Russian saint, Ignatius Branchaninov, said, you cannot really preach unless you know the times you're living in. So he advanced the idea of studying the culture you live in. We have a lot of study to do especially after the recent elections here in the United States. A lot of time to study these things. And we shouldn't come to quick conclusions. So even more so, we won't when we study the apocalypse and eschatology. We must be cautious, not too explicit or specific. Uh, we cannot explain that which God has not revealed to us. There is a progressive revelation of what those end times will look like. We must be aware of that. Apocalyptic writing is not the same thing as eschatology. And I'll get into that when I go. Eschatology is broader than apocalypsis. God bless you. Uh, that is a specific way of writing about a historical period and a prophecy too. So apocalypsis is somewhat different than the teaching on the end times, but it's included within the broader general topic. If a Christian is going to speak about the end times at all, and especially the book of Revelation, it's clear that in everything else, his words have to be sober, precise, and accurate in accordance with the teachings of the church over the centuries. And there, there are... Uh, for Christians, especially in the church, the study of the end times includes the whole drama of Christ's invisible presence throughout the Old Testament, his birth, life, teachings, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, and most especially the promise of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost. So it's the whole life of the church. In the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, all the major events of Christ's life and the destiny of the world are contained. All of us priests will say this, remembering the saving commandment and all those things which have come to pass for us, that they have already come to pass for us. Listen. The cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into heaven, the sitting at the right hand, the second and glorious coming. We'll get to how that is in, in, in my future explanation. So our life in the church in, is the kingdom to come that's already here. The then and the there is the here and the now. The kingdom of God has come and it will come. The end times then for the Orthodox Church and the sacramental church that we're in is a positive thing. 
It's not just a negative reflection of what's going to happen when everything falls apart, but it's a positive connection to everything that's always a part of Christ. It doesn't fall apart from Christ. It's a part of Christ now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. And with that, I'll end my lectures and <laughs> we can decide. What else can I say? And the truth is that when the, the angel with the flaming sword, you know, prevented Adam from going back to paradise, which is beautifully described on Forgiveness Sunday in the church, that paradise is still there. It's not like God closed that from us because we know that in Pascha, that angel opens that door and allows us into the kingdom of God. And every Sunday is a little Pascha as we were taught when we were in seminary. So the cycle is, there's, there's a yearly, a monthly, a, 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 a hagiology, a study of the saints, but there's also a weekly with the octoyos, the eight tones, the eight days, the resurrection day, the first day, the eighth day, the first day of the new creation, and the eighth day of the forever kingdom of God, which is therefore eschatological. Father Shemem would be happy I said that. <laughs> he always said, do not reduce the end times to one historical event. Do not separate the supernatural from the natural. Do not reserve our participation in the kingdom of God for a reward or a punishment after death because it's always with us. If we lose the eschatological, he called, dimension or intuition of the church, we lose our participation in the kingdom of God itself. So his emphasis was always on that. So I hope he understands the fact I'm opening up a subject he never opened up. There is good news and bad news. There's a positive expectation of a glorious and eternal reign of Christ in a renewed universe. The third chapter of Second Peter talks about a fire of illumination and a fire of purgation, a fire that cleans and a fire that warms and a fire that enlightens. So all of that is it true. And then there is also a negative side of judging evil and Satan his last stand. Not Custer's last stand, Satan's last stand. The doctrine of the end times is far more engrossing than the best drama that gifted artists can give us. There is nothing more captivating. There are unforgettable characters, unforgettable scenes. Nobody could really make a movie out of the book of Revelations. No one could really plumb its depths because it takes a spiritual a person to really read that book with calmness and patience to realize it's a religious text. I mean, a liturgical text. The fifth and the ninth chapters especially. And even the sixth chapter where we hear of the martyrs under the altar, we just brought a relic of St. Mary of Egypt to be venerated here in the church. So we see that the martyrs and the saints are always present with us so the kingdom of God is with us even in the presence especially of the saints too. Uh, the one thing has to be said, it is not pleasing to the Lord for our moral benefit to reveal the last day of this earth, the day of the coming of the Son of Man. It is not for you to know the times or the season, for the Father has put it into his own power, Acts chapter 1 and verse 7. The fact that the time is unknown should arouse us to spiritual vigilance. Take heed, watch, for you do not know the time when I will come. For what I say to you, I say to all for all times, watch, Mark chapter 13, verses 33 through 37. That, by the way, which some people would find interesting, is the basis of the cycle of prayer for monastics. It was the expectation of the second coming of Christ. The midnight prayers, the matins, first hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, Compline, 
you have the whole cycle because it's a never-ending prayer. It's a waiting for Christ to come. In the first century, that was the expectation. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation, St. Paul said. There was a constant expectancy, the Greeks called nipsis, and alertness to the second coming of Christ. So sometimes people don't put that together. The monastics were waiting for the second coming of Christ, and they still are. I mean, that, that, that's a basis or foundation for a lot of monastic life. It's not something in and of itself. It's for the church. It's the waiting with the Jesus prayer, connecting all those corporate prayers and forever praying then. Pray without ceasing, St. Paul says. That's also an aspect of the Jesus prayer. It's not just for, it is, but it's not only a pious practice to keep us from the passions, which it is, and it's essential for that. But it's also getting us ready for when that day comes. And we don't know when that is. However, the unknowability of the time of the Lord shouldn't prevent us from studying it, and that's what we're doing here. The Lord taught from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as a branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things, you know that he is at the very gates. And, he, and the Lord puts this in the 24th chapter after the whole summary of the end times of St. Matthew. Then he said, know that that summer is near. So we're getting a little more uh, dramatic here. What are the teachings which we know clearly? Which we know clearly. We know that Christ will come again in glory, and he shall come again to judge the living and the dead, as we say in the Nicene Creed. We know that at his coming, um, we shall be raised from the dead, and given the resurrection bodies made for the kingdom of God. In your baptism, those bodies are already renewed. When the little ones come out of the font, they may cry, and we may think that they're crying because they're scared. But in a way, the cry is also a trumpet call because God has now taken them into himself. Those who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And we put then the white robe over them as, the, as a sign that now their bodies are already renewed. They're charged with Jesus' DNA. <laughs> I was waiting to say that. <laughs> so from now on, we become cells in the body. He's always the head and we're cells in the body and we're part of that body of Christ. We're working in harmony with him. Therefore, let us love one another that with one accord we may confess Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When the cells work together, the body's healthy. So this baptism then is, is part of the resurrection body already in anticipation that we will receive. At baptism, the soul is already resurrected. And maybe I'll have a chance to, to talk about the 20th chapter of Revelations where it says those who, who are in the first resurrection do not have to fear the second death, which really means the general uh, judgment that comes at the end of time because those who participate in the first resurrection are the baptized who have remained true to their baptism. So you've already passed from judgment. And by the way, I'm talking sacramentally here uh, about this introduction. Uh, maybe I should continue this in a sense. Because when you go to confession, you're already helping yourself because you won't have to answer these things before your own judgment because it's a judgment now, see. You're, you're allowing God to judge you now so that you can clean yourself and your soul which is, will be resurrected for Christ when you enter into the eternal glory of Christ. So we, we know that Christ will raise the living and the dead. We'll have a resurrection body which are already prepared in a sense through baptism for the kingdom of God. There will be a general judgment for all mankind that will take place. Uh, Metropolitan Anthony, am I speaking too quickly, John? Okay. Sometimes I get carried away. 
<laughs> There's so many things to say about it. But you know, also we have to realize that at the general judgment of mankind that we're always talking about a choice in the society we live in, but the two most important events of our life, we have no choice. Metropolitan Anthony Bloom said, you're created, God's decision to create you. You have a judgment, you're responsible for how you live. You have no choice, you have to go before God for how you live. And that's why I, I, one writer once said, well, if we have a Statue of Liberty on the East Coast, we should have a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast so that the two could come together. If I'm given life, I'm responsible for the life I live. So there's a creation and there's a judgment. In between, we make choices along the way that are secondary to the primary choice that God made for us. So everyone will be resurrected and they will be judged. And it says many times, especially in the fifth chapter of St. John, according to what you have done in this life and maybe in the second chapter of Romans as well, and, through, and the 13th chapter of St. Matthew, where those who are doing good shine like the sun in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom will have no end after that. So let me go through those. We know that Christ will come in glory. He will judge the living and the dead. We will be raised up in our resurrection bodies. Everyone will be judged. So everyone will be raised from the dead. Even those who don't believe will still be raised from the dead and have a resurrection body either with God or not. For as by one man came sin, by another man came forgiveness of sins. As in Adam all died, so in Christ shall all be made alive. I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 through 22, but it's almost similar language in the fifth chapter of Romans. The reason I'm giving you these scriptures is so that you can go and check them out. I'm sure everybody will after this evening. Go and check all these scriptures out and see. The bishop really did order them pretty well. <laughs> these revelations from the Bible comprise the structure of our teaching, almost like a skeleton of a body. And the anatomy of this doctrine, then, is before us. Uh, that is my introduction to eschatology. I will say a few words about just reading the book of Revelations now, because that is the most famous book in the Bible about the teachings of the end times. I want you to remember there are layers of meaning in the book of Revelation. First thing is, it's liturgically based, and I'll get to that. It's a liturgical vision that St. John has on the island of Patmos. Then, you, it, it does things simultaneously, so that's what makes its reading difficult. Whenever you have teachers that will teach, it's not only historical, and it's not only moral, and it's not only futuristic or prophetic. It's all of those all at once. And sometimes the history is more dominant. And sometimes the moral teaching is more dominant. Sometimes the future is overwhelming. And you can't always determine what is he saying here, what is he saying there. So you have to read it all together. That's why it's important to know the history of the church, what end times people have gone through throughout, what difficulties and martyrdom and the periods of it. So we have to simultaneously, when we're reading this book, remember the past, reflect on the present, and predict the future all at once. You have a historical preparation, you have a contemporary situation, and you have a future condition all at once. So I, I hope, if it's too hard what I'm saying, it, you still have to wrestle with it. And don't do it alone, and don't do it outside of the teachings of the church, and that's why I'm giving these. A theological interpretation of past events is coupled with a moral explanation of how we're to live now, and it anticipates a clarion call for what we will find at the end of time in the history of mankind all at once. So I wanted to go through that. 
Do you have any questions so far? I don't mind stopping for a few questions before I go on to my uh, continuing the apocalypse and then what we would call the eschatology of the liturgy. Okay, I'll keep going. So what does the word apocalypse mean in Greek? Apokalyptin, apokalypsis, apokalyptin. It means to take the cover off. Apo means from. And kaliptin means cover, from the cover. So you're taking the cover off events. You're uncovering something that's unknown and needs to be uncovered. Biblically, it relates to the secrets of the future or unveiling of events in the last days. It is a style of writing or a genre. There's apocalyptic literature in the Old Testament, especially what is the most apocalyptic uh, prophetic writing in the Old Testament? Who said Daniel? Daniel's correct. Very, especially chapters 7 through 12, it's very much. And then uh, Zechariah has a lot of, of that in it and then Ezekiel has much of it and then even Isaiah has uh, it's called the little apocalypse in chapter 24 through 27 of Isaiah's prophecy too so all these things are enmeshed and interpenetrate as a genre so it's like the uh, sports page in reading that or business news in the USA Today or something, so you're expecting a certain way of writing or a funeral notice, an obituary. So it's a way of presenting a prophetic message. Apocalypses have bizarre visions, nightmares, dreams, creatures that are almost put together bizarrely, supernatural happenings, numbers that have meanings that cannot be exactly understood, but we're accustomed to symbols. United States symbol is the eagle. If you were to make an animal. And what is Russia? Bear. The bear. There's a bear in the woods. <laughs> Remember that commercial, the, the Ronald Reagan commercial? There's a bear in the woods. <laughs> I don't know why I remember. Yeah, some things, those, they do a good job, those people. <laughs> Those marketing people. I never forgot that's years ago. <laughs> a beaut- beautiful narration, too. That low, sonorous, s- a second baritone. There's a bear in the woods. <laughs> and then England is what? It's a lion. And China is a dragon. So you can go with all kinds of countries. So there's a apocalypsis there. Uh, Perhaps not even the original readers understood all of the writings of the Apocalypse because it had to be hidden. And they were speaking in a time of martyrdom where especially either Nero or the Domitian uh, persecutions either in 60 or 90 AD, 64 AD, the burning of Rome, where the Christians were actually torched. but that's how they converted the world. The martyrs. That was the witness to the resurrection. Apocalypses are part then of a very concrete historical situation. And it's a veiled way of writing about it to encourage people to fight the good fight, to keep their faith where the, it was hard to It was very hard in the Decian persecution in the time of uh, St. Cyprian of Carthage. It was the first time that we had to apply the uh, return of lapsed Christians. Before, for 150 years, there were no system of confession the way we take it now. And there was only, in the time of the writing of the Twelve Apostles, called the Didache, there was only one return if you apostatized or left the church. In the time of the lapsed, there were a problem of lots of people that were good Christians up until the time of 
needing to be martyred, where St. Cyprian had to determine how will we bring them back into the church. And that was the first development of the canon of penance that developed as we learned in school. Remember, Father? We've been doing a lot of pastoral work since then, but isn't it nice to go back to this pure academic teaching? <laughs> we always thought that if we succeeded academically well, we were on the road for pastoral success. We're still on that road. <laughs> so, apocalypses also are riddles and puzzles that need to be put together because of the terror of the authorities. You couldn't speak openly. You had to speak in code, like those code breakers in World War II. Remember that? Those co- I never saw that movie. I've only seen two movies in 10 years. <laughs> and I hardly ever watch TV. I'm always permanently transient. I'm traveling from place to place. So, I, but, but I remember a, like a preview of the code breakers, and that's what they are. Breaking codes is what the apocalypse is. They come in these historical difficult times. Uh, Christians, especially in pagan Rome, began to use these methods of explaining their situation. Where did this kind of genre come from? Well, it, there is a specific time when it begins, this kind of writing. It's at the time of the Persian rule after it's 538 when Cyrus the Great gave permission to uh, Zerubbabel, the last remaining link to the Davidic dynasty and to the hopeful Messiah, and Ezra and Nehemiah returning to the Holy Land to rebuild the temple, the second temple. They were given, an, it's called the Edict of Cyrus in 538, I believe, or 535, where this was given. And he's praised in, in Isaiah's chapter 40 through 66, as well as Cyrus the Great. So it's a way, it comes from a background of God coming from heaven down to man. And you can read it in the 7th through 12th chapters of. Daniel it talks in seventh chapter about the son of ninth chapter I think, the son of man coming from heaven. And coming to earth, and that's an image Jesus uses in the gospel a lot. So, apocalypse comes during that time of heaven on earth, uh, an enchanted time, when the heavens heavenly presence is here. There are three conceptions of the of Christ in the Old Testament, by the way. Uh, One is the Davidic dynasty that shall be set up by the Messiah in chapter 11 of Isaiah. And the other is of chapter 7 and 9 of Daniel, which talks about the Son of Man coming from heaven. And the other conception of the suffering servant, uh, chapter 52, the last three verses, and all of 53 of Isaiah. Now, the time of Jesus, they were expecting the Davidic king to come. And these other two conceptions of son of man, this this kind of Persian idea of the apocalypse I'm talking about, and then also of coming from heaven to earth, which Jesus talks explicitly in the 13th chapter of Mark, the 24th chapter. That's how the son of man will come again in glory from heaven to earth in in his ascendant form in his glory in his his uh, presence before the father and they saw remember when jesus multiplied the loaves well they were thinking if he can do that and he can raise jesus daughter he's the messiah because his army will last forever he will raise them up you you he will be the one to go into jerusalem and take over the city and establish an earthly reign forever. And that, by the way, is a confusion of some of the dispensational theology in the Protestant circles where Christ will set up a a millennial kingdom on earth for a thousand years. It's a 
it's a specified view of the Messiah, but it doesn't take all those three forms together. King David, son of man, suffering servant, all together. Which I don't know if everyone looked at it that way. But they all converge in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So this is where it comes. There is a sense of black and white, good and evil, victory and defeat. I mean, there, it, and, and, and the, so if you read this kind of literature, there's that clarity. And God's on the good side, of course, and the devil isn't. Well, I didn't need to tell you that. <laughs> this is a kind of Gnostic, uh, uh, and its exaggeration is in a Gnostic reduction of Christianity to just the secret knowledge. So that's why a lot of times we don't practice it. It's seductive. It's I have this knowledge and you don't. And we wouldn't want to make it like that. So apocalypticism is confused in this way, but it issues from the fact that Christ is the sovereign Lord. It presents a worldview conditioned by the terror of the moment. The writers generally don't think much of the present, and they put all their hopes in the future. The uncanny sway of mysterious powers of evil are thrown against God in the final battle of history, for we do not contend against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of the world rulers of this present darkness, of spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. So here we have a real drama of who we compete against. These spiritual forces, men are merely almost like a science fiction movie, uh, the carriers of this war going on. The present age is under the domination of powers that are sinister. The age to come will be a freedom from moral corruption, evil oppression, and death. And God himself will intervene because no government can save us. No society can sustain us. Nor, no morality will maintain us. Only God. There will be a last judgment where God will bring all the judgment to the earth. And if you read chapters uh, 38 and 39 of Ezekiel, Gog and Magog, it really talks about that. Revelation chapter 16. And these are the important ones. The earth will be turned upside down and real like a drunkard. The sun and the moon will not be recognizable and they will recede into the darkness. History will be viewed as a reflux of a cosmic, cosmic struggle between God and evil powers where God wins. So it's a convincing the people that the age is drawing to a close. God's work in history, according to Israel's faith, was purposeful. Things were moving toward an end. And what does St. John say himself in the book of Revelations? He says, what is, Why am I writing to show you things that will shortly come to pass? Revelations 1 and 1. Thus, the subject of the Revelations or Apocalypse is the depiction of the final fate of the world. From the very beginning, the Church of Christ was to enter into a fierce battle with all wrong teachings. And it really had a fierce battle. You know, we here rest in the work of all those people. And we go to the triumph of orthodoxy, which maintained that Christ, all the heresies, all the heresies from the 3rd to the 8th century that were defined in the seven ecumenical councils had to do with who Christ is and what Christ is. Had to do with his nature and his person. Finally, the last one, all those battles of the iconoclasts and all those people that were martyred came to a final conclusion in seven great councils, the ecumenical doctrinal councils that we now share. So it was a battle to maintain the faith and to know who Christ is now. 
if you want to look at all those remembrances we do, that's what it always has to do with, Christ being both God and man. Therefore, the vivid picture of this battle is presented to us in the Apocalypse. Lots of information there. But I hope I gave you a perspective and, and purview of all of these things. When you read that book or anything, don't think you can comprehend all of it. It was even somewhat mysterious to the people at the time of which it was written. And there are scholars that debate when the times were actually 64 AD, 60 AD, 90 later on. Which persecution was it? They're not sure. But we believe through the Holy Fathers that the important thing is it's historical, it's moral, and it's prophetic all at the same time, as I said previously. Now we get to what we know that the end times is here all the time, the end times is here all the time in the divine liturgy. Jesus is the high priest and he celebrates every liturgical service. The relationship then between the divine liturgy and the end times is consistent and complete. During his earthly life and death and in his resurrection, Christ was over, overthrew the power of Satan. He invaded his territory by entering the strong man's house and binding him, as it says in the Gospels. He has disarmed the principalities and the powers and made a public example of them, trampling upon, I like that, trampling upon them. Very good military imagery. Colossians 2 and 15. So Jesus invaded this realm of the evil forces, rendered the ruler of this world a decisive defeat. He is like a dog on a chain. A Rottweiler. I don't know, maybe you're good Rottweilers. I don't mean to say that if you have a pet. <laughs> but he can still bite, but he can't win. You've got to get close enough so that he can. But he's still held in check. So Jesus has invaded this realm, rendered him a defeat over these principalities and powers. And because of his victory and his death and exaltation, the tide of the battle is turned. Since Pentecost, the gospel has been preached in a number of lands. We don't know if it's been preached everywhere because that will be really a sign of when he comes. But his resurrection and ascension, he's entered into a new experience of his messiahship. And this is kind of interesting if you see the bishop. When the bishop comes and he's in his black, he carries a wooden staff until he makes the entrance to the cilia through the holy doors. When he comes out again, it's a golden scepter. Because he goes in as the one who takes upon himself the sins of the world and the burden and, the, the, and his, his appearance is marred, as it says. But when he comes out, he has the crown on. He has the beautiful vestments. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And even before he, he does the anaphora and we do the great entrance, he comes out of the throne in the high place and moves towards the earth in his glorified the presence by leaving the altar and going to the body and taking you all with him when he receives the holy gifts and the omophorian is put over his shoulder because he's taken upon himself the illness of human nature and he set it at the throne on high with the Father. So liturgically even then, we see this end time being carried out. So he's coming as a suffering one and he's revealed as the glorious one in the uh, vestments of the bishop. Now he is enthroned at God's right hand. Now his sufferings are past. He's entered upon his reign. He will continue to reign until all the enemies have been subdued, until the last enemy, death, is trampled under his feet. And that is in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 25. Jesus is now Lord of Lord and Kings of Kings. He's already enthroned. He's already fulfilled the 19th chapter of the book of Revelations. For us as Christians, we are in the throne room of God. That's why we sing the thrice holy hymn. 
because the angels can only sing it, but we can sing it too because we're in that kingdom. That's the beauty of it. The Lord is, is, is reigning. His second coming will mean nothing less than the lordship that he already has in the church being revealed to the whole world. This is the new Jerusalem. And that's why we say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That comes from Psalm 118. That was said during the time of when the people expected the Messiah to come from the Mount of Olives and meet them in the city of Jerusalem. Well, that new city of Jerusalem is here now in the kingdom of God. And so it's a blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. It's a realized eschatology. Uh, Father Meyendorf used to say that. So while I'm looking in the camera, it's not mine. It's realized. <laughs> it's realized. I love this. This is my most exciting part of my lecture so far. When we pray then, thy kingdom come, it's not only piety again. It's not only our prayer. It's thy kingdom come. It's, a, it's an asking for that glorified Christ to rule on earth in the kingdom of God, in the church, in the Holy Spirit, for the Father, now and ever. <coughs> so, John, will this, everybody see all of my gestures and excitement as well? <laughs> Lord have mercy. This, but isn't it? Now and ever. And unto ages of ages, amen. See? You see the eschatological dimension, even to the Lord's Prayer. And there's one interesting connection with that, too. Who does Jesus teach the Lord's Prayer to first? Yes. Privately. How shall we pray? They say, pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And then in the 10th chapter, he sends them out to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to preach the good news. It's eschatological. It's end times prayer. And who does Jesus give the prayer to? And in what place does he want it really said? During the divine liturgy of the sacrament of the Last Supper, when he commissions them, do this in remembrance of me. So when do they place the Lord's Prayer? Before they begin to do the consecration of the holy gifts and before they give them to us. And who continues the apostles' work? The bishops and the priests. So that's why we say, Our Father, thy kingdom come. Be with us now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. There are several prayers in the Divine Liturgy that bring out Christ's present messianic rule and priesthood. When the deacon and the priest go to the high place after the Trisagian prayer, the priest quotes the messianic salutation I said in chapter in Psalm 118, Blessed art thou on the throne of the glory of thy kingdom, who sittest upon the cherubim, always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. The priest's prayer after the cherubic hymn, O Lord our God, who rulest over those in heaven and on earth, who art born on the throne of the cherubim, who art Lord of the seraphim and King of Israel, who alone art holy and dost rest in thy saints. And when the priest enters the holy place and the altar of sacrifice and places the holy gifts on the altar, what does he say? On the throne with the Father and with the Spirit. That's it. And then, following the Lord's Prayer, attend, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, out of thy holy dwelling place from the throne of the glory of thy kingdom. And then, in the liturgy of St. Basil the Great, at the prayer of the elevation, let us attend, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, out of thy holy dwelling place from the throne of the glory of thy kingdom. Come and sanctify us, who, who sittest on high with the Father, and art here invisibly present with us. And by thy mighty hand, impart unto us thy most pure body and precious blood, and through us unto all thy people. And it's a very beautiful... I remember, remember Father Alexander uh, Schmemann, Father, who would always say this as, as the key to the synaxis, or when the people gather. He said there are three movements in the liturgy. One, 
we begin the liturgy as soon as you leave your house and begin to be gathered in the church. The other is God's home is always there, and the other is God's repenting people are there finally to receive the gifts of God, especially in the Holy Communion that they receive. Well, the, when the deacon serves with the bishop, he, he asks, is it time to begin the service to the Master Lord? And he said, me the, and he said, bless me, the Lord God remember you. He's blessed as God, always known and ever unto ages of ages. And then the priest says, and the bishop says, may the Lord God direct thy steps to every good deed. May the Lord God remember you in his kingdom always, now and ever. And he says, bless master, blessed is the kingdom of the God, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So that is a movement from the earth to heaven. It's time now to get rid of chronology and enter into the timelessness of God. Now's the time. (laughs) St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews must be read then within this liturgical framework. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed on behalf of God to offer gifts and sacrifices, Hebrews 5 and 1. We have as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul a hope that enters into the inner shrine. And this is what we do when we enter into the holy place. When the bishop makes his keron and he he venerates the altar, then we close the holy doors because he's now entered into the shrine. We open them when he emerges. So all of this then is a realized eschatology. And I have many, many other references, but I wanted you to realize and know that this is how we understand the true and full force of end times prophecy. Christ has come in the incarnation. Christ is with us in the church through the Holy Spirit. He is present. So, He is past, he is present, and he will come again in the future. All that converges and happens at once in the divine liturgy. Well, I have some time if you would like some questions answered, if you have any questions so far. Well... I don't know, I tend to exhaust you already of of all this information. We can, yes, Father. Why do you think the book is not read? Why do you think the book is not read liturgically? The book of Revelations? Because people wouldn't understand all those layers of meaning. What's historical, what's moral, what's futuristic. And then they would be detracted from the presence of the kingdom of God in their midst because they'd be thinking of all those images, those bizarre visions, and those prophecies. And so then they would be distracted rather than attracted to the divine liturgy. Especially people's curious minds. Not that it's bad, but it's just not read liturgically. It took a long time before the book of Revelation was even included in the canon of scriptures. A long time. Centuries. Yes? Uh, Bishop Anthony, why was it written so cryptically? Why isn't it written clearly so we can understand it? It was written cryptically because the, the Christians were being persecuted during the time of the... That's all apocalypsis genre. Whenever they're written, they're written so people can understand them, can't completely know what it is. For example, the 18th chapter mentioned Babylon the Great falling. Of course, it's not Babylon, it's Rome. The 12th, the woman sitting on the seven hills. So there's enough of an indication that it means a place name, especially like Rome or a kingdom, but it's not so clear that a, an authority would say, this is seditious, and where therefore you are under penalty of, of death or prison. That's why it's always veiled. And in fact, people, even in the time of its historical setting, didn't understand it completely. 
the hope of the writer, I believe, in St. John was a moral attitude. This is how we must live in order to enter into God's kingdom. And even if we're martyred, if we have this in us, we're safe. You know, so that's what my answer would be. Uh, do we have a sense of uh, to what degree the, uh, that revelation was circulated in the church at the time after it was written? I do not know of the extent of its circulation, but I suspect that even if in, it isn't in its present form, all those churches in Asia Minor that were mentioned in the first three chapters of the book of Revelations were the ones who were being you know, encouraged by St. John in the island of Patmos and during the persecutions, especially in Rome. Uh, so they knew about this book. But it wasn't a canon of scripture for a long time because of the imagery in it and the imprecision of it, which was purposefully done. I mean, all the opening of the seals and the plagues and the pouring of the bowls and all of that almost happens at a real pattern of every three or four chapters, the same thing is repeated. And then you have a moral exhortation in the middle of that. Then you have a prophetic anticipation at the end of that. Chapters 11 through 19 are all prophetic. Chapter 11, you have uh, the two prophets that come back and preach in the city of Jerusalem. And then chapter 12, you have the contrast between the, the good and the bad woman. And then chapter 13, the beast of the apocalypse, the antichrist and the prophet, all of which maybe I will get to if I can. That And then chapter 14 and 15, the great battle of Armageddon. And then the settling and the great judgment on 19, and then the kingdom that's the new heaven and the new earth that comes in 2021 and 22. So that's the pattern of that. But I don't know the extent of it. Uh, maybe some scholar does, but I don't know it. Yes, I may be thinking linear, linearly here, but you said it was written apocalyptically to kind of hide it from the times of the martyr did. Yeah. So so those historical times, some of those have passed, the Rome and such. So, so do you know, wh where are we in there? Or is this yeah. not a continuum? I mean, because some things have passed and some things are that's, to come. That's why I said it's, it's layered and interpenetrated. So you have three things happening. A real historical events that really is addressed by, the, by St. John. Then you have the moral implication of what that means. How are we to live in such a time? Then you have the future when this Rome is symbolic of a latter Rome or of a coming Rome or of a coming kingdom as, as the fathers would say under the leadership of the Antichrist. The world government, the world religion, all the stuff that everyone's really interested in and that you really hope I get to soon. <laughs> uh, and so, that, so this is what... This is what it is. So this prophecy then is anticipating what that Rome will be. You, you look at the four beasts in there, and there are different designations. of. First you have the Babylonian Empire, and then you have the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, or, the, or some would say that the Roman Empire is like a division between the Medes and the Persians, and so there's some discussion right there. But you have Antiochus Epiphanes, which is the Seleucid, uh, Greek who wanted, wanted to make the uh, Judean religion into a pagan religion and they set up the abomination of desolation in the temple. That was a direct reference then to Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 BC and the feast of Hanukkah is the liberation of uh, the return of that in uh, 164 BC. Antiochus Epiphanes. When, P, when Saint, I'm not saying, um, Alexander the Great died in 3, I think 33 or 323 BC, his empire broke up into four empires with his generals Cassander, Lassimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And so the Seleucid 
empire was in the Syrian Asia Minor region. And that was Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphanes, God with us. <laughs> so he was the one that was the abomination of desolation, put up the pagan standard. And then Titus and Vespasian in Rome in 70 AD also did that. And so that's what they referred to as the abomination of desolation in Daniel. And Jesus said, let the w reader understand. So in the latter times, that abomination will affect the new Israel, the church, uh, that prophecy. So you could say that that's an anticipation of what would happen, many of the fathers say, that would, including St. John of Damascus, an ex exact exposition of the Orthodox faith. So it means Rome, but it means the coming world empire as well. But we can't, we don't know that timeline, we don't know for sure, because every era has apocalyptic moments. I wish I could answer it specifically. So people interpret every modern event as being apocalyptic, but they all are. If you look at the things in the, in the book of Revelation, those plagues and those catastrophes, they happen all the time. But I think near the end, they will happen in more, force, for, more forcefully and in more intensified way. And that's what a lot of the writers and the prophecies say. It'll be the same kind of catastrophes and terrors and diseases and, and plagues on mankind, but it will be in a more concentrated form. Now, when that time comes, we're not sure. I mean, that, it could be, but the more you grow spiritually, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Not only will they see God, but they'll see events that are happening in the world that are, that are there too. I'm just reviewing it historically and theologically. But you will have a sense of when these things are really becoming uh, uh, important for you to, to learn. Now everybody will decide now is the time or not the time, but we should be ready all the time, and, and I'll get into it more. Maybe I can speak a little. Of, we have the, uh, it used to be church and state, the double-headed eagle for most of, of Orthodox Christian history. Then we have people that have religious and moral base that came during the pilgrims uh, coming to the U.S. It was a religiously based freedom of, not freedom from, religion in the 17th century here to form the United States in 13 colonies. They were all religious colonies. You couldn't even vote unless you were a member of the church. Did you know that? That was where caucuses came from. Because that's where people were able, because if they could say they were members in good standing, then they could vote. Because it had to reflect the, the Protestant milieu they were in. So that's important. Well now, so they had separation of church and state because they didn't want a church to uh, determine what their religious uh, life would be. So it was a freedom to practice, not a freedom from practice. Well, if you open liberty up to the freedom of religion, you can have the freedom from religion. That's the outcome of a, a liberty that's not founded in a moral basis. So take the Ten Commandments out of the courthouse, take the prayers out of the school, etc., etc. Not that prayers aren't valuable, but who's to say one prayer should take precedent over another? But that's so slippery, slippery, slippery. <coughs> what happens when then the only thing you can agree on is nobody should be first? So if nobody's first, it's not there, except in a private place of your own home or your own church. So public policy is no longer determined by public faith. Separation of church and state, hesitation of church and state. Until you get now the intrusion of the state in the church with sometimes an opposition of church and state where legality becomes the basis of morality rather than morality being the basis of legality. Now that's apocalyptic <laughs> to a certain degree. 
But then you have still the free exercise of your will and things change depending on who's in power. It's fluid. So we can't say now is the time and it wasn't the time before. But I'm just commenting that's pretty interesting. The separation of church and state, the hesitation of church from state, the opposition of church and state. the subject, but what you said a few minutes ago about the different references in the book to uh, things that really happened in the past or things that might happen in the future, is it possible that the apocalypse has been going on ever since? Yes. And it's, it's an ongoing process. It's not like it's going to happen in the future, but it's, it's all, we're already in it, and we've been in it for 2,000 years. Yes. That's the. Can, can uh, did we pick that up? No. What, we, we we did we did yeah. So the apocalypse is an ongoing. It's a dynamic condition of Christianity, no matter when Christians live. So there's always principalities and powers, and world rulers of this present darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness. But it's also a future. It's also a prophecy. It's also a history. So it's both and. We're going through it, but it becomes more of a storm cloud as we get closer to it. So the funnel cloud is forming, and we hope we have good assurance rather than flood insurance. (laughs) I love doing those alliterations like that. Are there any other questions before we... Take a yes, Father. I, your grace, I, I, okay. <laughs> we uh, regret that I have pastoral obligations tomorrow, which will prevent me from hearing the rest of your talk. But um, you, in as much as you just pointed out that the church early on avoided. Um, an emphasis on the book of Apocalypse liturgically and therefore uh, seeing that it could have a negative effect on people uh, somehow distract them. Yes. And then also um, confuse them. Confuse them. But later on in medieval times, of course, the images came back and they, you know, there's iconographic and other images. So the theme and then even liturgically, and as you said last, forgive the Sunday and the judgment, those themes are resonate in the church. Yes. But today, um, thinking of the 20th century, wherein we see the apocalypse graphically come to, re- to, to, to existence. I mean, the, the gas chambers, atomic uh, the bombs, everything, everything. The gulags, yes, everything. And um, so, and now, and, and the politically today, we see something apocalyptic. So, the realized eschatology that the kingdom lasts forever and is here to stay, and it is now. So, the emphasis on realized eschatology, which is the only thing that's worth living for, um, what do we need to make that more um, accessible, more? Uh, how can we alert people to that, that, that that's the same salvation of the world? I mean, maybe we, you know, the emphasis on the symbols and the, 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 the beasts and all that. All of this is so important. I'm not saying that, but somehow we in the church, there's something now that we maybe aren't doing enough in light of the fact that the apocalypse is so graphically real and scaring the wits of people and leading them to all kind of which way uh, and not enough to, you know, the realized kingdom that we Orthodox have. Father, but, I think that's what our that's our challenge as clergy people, priests, bishops, uh, deacons, all of us, teachers in the church. We have to tell the people that you you have to have a purified heart so that you have the realization that God is. Christ is in our midst, as we say, liturgic Christ. He is and ever shall be. That we know that in a direct, intimate, and personal way 
through the practices, disciplines, sacraments, saints of the church. And the more we participate in the church, the clearer all this becomes, and the more sheltered we are, and the more prepared we are, and the more present the kingdom of God is with us. The kingdom is always here. How do we appropriate it? How, does it, how do we make the objective presence a subjective experience? How do we make that objective kingdom of God, which is here liturgically, a subjective personal experience? That's the goal of the Christian life. And that's really what the Orthodox Church gives us. The more assured we are of that, the more ready we are for whatever happens in our life. How do we do that? By explaining the importance of the Orthodox Church to people. When asked, when people are invited to come say it is an experience of that kingdom, you won't maybe get it immediately, but the more you stay and the more you practice, the more clear it becomes. It's almost like if I take my glasses off, I can still see you somewhat. If I put them on, I can see you clearly. And when we start out in our spiritual life, we have more of a myopic vision than a telescopic one. Eventually, we get to see very focused and very clear by being a part of the church. So that is the goal of presenting the, ch the church through our ministry. How do we make it clear to our people? That is something that's not always easy. If people think, well, our services are too long, so can you shorten them up a little? The sermons are too long. Can you be more concise? Um, all of these things. We face that as clergy, but we have to somehow enthuse and inspire them to know, take it to yourself. This isn't just something we do. This is someone we know. And there is the spiritual life for us. Each one in their own way. Each one coming some quicker, some slower. That's, by the way, the church is always the same liturgically. Because people have to have a, a lot of time to approach it in their own way. Some people get here quicker than others. If the service changes all the time, you won't have your identity as a solid, predictable identity. You need it. I mean, it wouldn't be good if our parents moved every week. <laughs> we, we like our comfort zones, don't we? We like the familiarity of our own home. We, you know, now that I'm permanently transient as a bishop, I miss almost nostalgically the permanence of the home I grew up in. Now we can count on the permanence of our eternal home we're growing up in, which is the church. So there, there is an example. I hope maybe I talked around it, but what we really need. The apocalypticism is just a reflection in history of our realization of that kingdom daily because our end times will probably come before the end times. My end times will be much more the four horsemen of the apocalypse are going to catch me before we get caught in a historical cyclone of events. I hope I was sober enough in my presentation and complete enough in these introduction, apocalypse, and realized eschatology. Especially I want to emphasize that last point. That kingdom is here to the extent that we can live it in our lives. And just come as you can and as you must. Everyone has their own soul they take with them. Everyone can absorb what they can. And that's why we're here consistently. Maybe next week you'll get the prayer that you didn't get this week. 
That, by the way, is important why everyone should come to church, because you add your own personal, unique experience of God to the experience of everyone else being there. Sometimes when you pray, your prayer is much more concentrated than the, another's prayer. So they come with a very difficult week, and they've been swamped by the world. They've been overcome by their job. They've been disappointed with their kids. They've been not communicating with their spouse. All these things. And then they come a little distracted, but maybe you had a great week. And so your prayer carries them. And they carry them to the kingdom, which is the... They're able to focus then. Once there was a man that really didn't go to church much, and, he, and I thought of it just like I'm saying no. And sometimes God gives you these revelations, doesn't he, fathers? It just comes to people... He said, you know, I love God and, I, and I, can, I can worship him in the fields and in the meadows. I said, of course, you should. Which kind of, but you need to come for the other people who need your unique experience of goodness so that you can share it with them and your prayer with them. Otherwise, you deprive them of the fullness of their own experience of Christ. I was proud of myself at that time. <laughs> I didn't tell anyone. But. Isn't that right? There was never a time the kingdom was not here. There was never a time the kingdom was not here. Well, there was a time... Well, the kingdom is always here when Christ is here. Repent for the kingdom of God, you know, is here. So he was here. But in in the Old Testament, it was kind of a preparation. So the kingdom was there, but not in its fullness. And it became full when Pentecost came. So the kingdom was always here. God was always here. But it was here in anticipation and in, in preparation for its fullness in the New Testament. While that makes complete sense, while that makes complete sense, it doesn't make sense that Christ didn't have his kingdom before he came on earth because he is co-eternal with the Father. Right. That, that was the beginning of my question, actually. But... In, 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 it's both and. I mean, he's always here, so his kingdom is always here. But it became fully realized, fully experienced when the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came to reveal its, its completeness and, and the apostles were chosen to make sure that the sacraments through the apostolic succession were maintained within the church. Um, the uh, St. Philaret of Moscow always emphasized the fact that the Bible was one book and the kingdom was always present, and the church was in the Garden of Paradise to begin with. And Adam and Eve were the first synaxis, the gathering with God in the church there. So we can also say that that is true. And you can look at the Bible really as a kind of model of what happens to all of us. Sometimes we go through the book of Numbers in the wilderness, and we're in the wilderness. Sometimes we're in the promised land of Jordan, Sometimes we lapse back into our, the pleasure-loving life of the world just the way it happened in the Old Testament. And then we finally are revived and repent and return, which the prophets always talked about. But its full expression is in the church now, in the realization of everything that was prepared in the Old Testament. But I like when St. Philaret said, the church has always been there. So in a way, paradise has always been a way for us. It's, it's kind of like there's a sort of a timelessness then, so everything's going on at the same time. In a sense. But there is also a linear chronological time as well. It's, once again, it's both and. God is always present, his kingdom is always there, but we understand it in a chronological way because we're put in time and space. And so the Bible really is a revelation of the eternal timelessness of God. So he's always there, but, but we experience it in the divisions and of time and space and history, whereas God has an eternal now that's ever present. And that's why in the kingdom of God we all say, uh, now and ever and unto ages of ages, amen. He's 
so that goes to that point. So it's both and. It's, it's preparation in chronological time historically, and it's realization in the timelessness of God's love for us existentially or philosophically or completely or religiously or spiritually, or that's the final adverb I will use. Does that make sense? It's both and. Any other questions? I think we need to mention the context of terrible inner suffering because we're sort of taught that that should not be, that you know we ought to be able to have the good life, and that flies straight in the fa- face of the fact that we're sinners and broken. And so that people have terrible inner suffering, but they feel like there's something wrong with them individually, not that they need to seek God, but they end up with the antidepressants and other things at huge rates in our culture. So there's something about shutting, admitting or acknowledging how universal this suffering is and even acknowledging it within ourselves, which people are not willing to do. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. That so are you saying that really the suffering of individuals and their repenting and their falling into sin, et cetera, is part of an end times movement in, in a general social sense. So my personal journey and my personal struggle, as it becomes more intensified or apparent or even shared with others, is a part of a general movement towards a time when that suffering will be relieved. When Those Christ people comes who came again. out of Russia and immigrated here, Father Schmemann, among them. Father Schmemann used to say that the world is a charnel house. They had a vision of how terrible it was. And that vision drove them into the church. And you know, you raise the question, how as bishops and priests that you can reach the people? You know, they there has to be an inner acknowledgement of life is failing them. If we look around our culture, life is failing us. It hasn't gone all the way yet. But, you know, okay. That's well, in that way, that's why the church is here, so that the kingdom of God can give a meaning to that suffering, not necessarily completely get rid of it until the second coming of Christ. Without the church, there would be no refuge for the suffering people. And even though people may not always be members of our church, the fact that we pray for the whole world gives it a chance of approaching the kingdom of God in our church. So we do a service to others through our own prayer. I've often thought, and this may be an eschatological dimension of the end times, that when we pray for people, God does listen to our prayers to the extent that we're pure in heart so that the problems they have don't stay. Did you ever think that in your own life you've had problems that at the moment of their understanding or you understand them, you wonder if they'll ever go away. You'll wonder if you'll ever be able to unwind the perplexity of what that problem will bring to you. And then it goes away. And then, almost miraculously, The problem, even before you can think it out, isn't there anymore. I think it happens to people. Well, somebody's prayer worked. The saints, being in the church, God took it upon himself through the prayers of other people to make sure that there was a resolution even before an understanding of that problem was there for you. And those little miracles happen all the time, especially because we're praying. And that really is unsolvable problems, I think, a lot of monastics solve for us when they pray for us, where their life of prayer helps society. Some people say they're monostasis, alone by themselves standing, but really they're alone interceding for us, like all the saints are, to keep our lives in the world as regular, consistent, and peaceful as can be. 
That's an eschatological dimension of what you're saying. Well, everyone, I think we need a break here, and maybe there's not much more for the evening. Shall uh, we have like a 15-minute break, and then I'll just have a summary, and we can start tomorrow. The last and great day of Pentecost, uh, the light of the kingdom has always been present with us, and our life is hidden with Christ in God, as it says in Colossians 3 and verse 3. The experience of the church is the new reality, the new creation, the new life. It is not some other world that we're waiting, but it's a renewed world. So we, it's not something in replacement of a world, but it's a revived, vivified, energized, restored world that we've come into. God didn't create the world and say, I made a mistake and get rid of it. He renewed it in the church. Although sometimes that creatures, I remember my little niece, if I may have a little aside with this, she asked me why God made flies and mosquitoes. <laughs> and I said, well, they, they, they weren't as... Uh, they didn't bite and sting the way they do now. I tried to explain. They had their place before the creation. I couldn't mention the 11th chapter of Isaiah to a three-year-old <laughs> or the second chapter of Hosea to a three-year-old. So then I finally went back to, I guess I thought this was the best thing I could say, uh, their food for the birds. <laughs> which I thought was a good compromise. <laughs> she said they could eat other things. <laughs> <laughs> and she wanted to ask me this question in my room where my icon corner was, by the way. It was serious for her. They could eat other things. <laughs> she walked away dissatisfied with my answer. <laughs> Isn't that cute, those little ones? So it's a renewal of the kingdom of God. The liturgy of the church, the sacraments, are the experience of heaven on earth, as Father Alexander was talking about. Especially in the Epiclesis, we say, O Lord, thou didst send down thy most holy spirit upon thine apostles at the third hour, Take him not from us, O good one, but renew him in us who pray to thee. Renew him in us who pray to thee, and then make this bread the very body at the continuation. So that kingdom is present. If we have God in us, in the Holy Spirit, God beside us in the Son, and God ahead of us in the Father, we're okay in the Trinity. And that's, that's why we say in the liturgy, let us love one another, as I said before, that with one heart and mind we may confess, Father, Son, and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I realize maybe I'm not projecting well enough back there. Forgive me for that. But I'll try to make sure. So the kingdom of God then is announced, inaugurated, and given by Christ. It stands at the heart of the Christian faith. It's not something yet to come. It's something that's here. It's present. The resurrection and ascension really are communicated to us by the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to bring the presence of Christ to us. The nature which Christ saved, all this human nature, the stuff of what we are, is, is saved so that the who of what we are can really be expressed. The what of a me has to coincide with the who of me so that the whole of me can be saved. The what of me has to coincide with the who of me so that the all of me or the whole of me can be saved. And that's why God gives the whole of himself in the Son to us. We don't just get a part of Christ. We get the whole Christ so that we can be completely healed. And the resurrection, this is the last, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He is now making the joy, peace, 
of the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, 17, very present with us. <coughs> flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God because the, the flesh and blood has to be transformed uh, in its form so that the body can be renewed, the resurrection body. That's interesting. It doesn't mean that you don't take your identity or your body with you. Flesh and blood means that the earthly person who is affected by the corruption of sin cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That body has to be changed, renewed, revivified, has to have the DNA of Christ, has to have the baptism and the chrismation, has to partake of the nourishment of the Holy Communion in order for it to be ready and appropriate to the kingdom of God. And that is the realized eschatology. I really want to emphasize that throughout this whole presentation because that's the, the gem of what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. That's the full meaning of salvation and the redemption of Christ. Redemption means renewal. Redemption means the vivification and the energization, the energy of the Holy Spirit in us even now, preparing us for a never-ending ecstatic experience of the fullness of the kingdom of God, which is anticipated here and realized fully there uh, over and over again, to the extent that we can want it for ourselves. That's it. He fills all things with himself, as it says in Scripture, over and over. Therefore, we are always at an intersection of the way things are and the way things they could be. In the church, you'll find that your experience of the end times maybe is even more sensitive because you experience that kingdom which is yet to come, thy kingdom come, here and now in the way that we live our life in Christ. So then we become real conscious of things that before escaped our perception. And then we say, you know, things could be better. And then we have the temptation of trying to make out of the world a utopia. And it's not a bad thing, but because we've perceived the kingdom of God and we've received the kingdom of God, we conceive the world as being something that can be perfected now. But the world is paradoxical because it shows a darkness too. It's a mix of light and darkness. And you can't make out of something that's a problem into a solution. We have to live in the light of the kingdom to come now, realizing you can't expect the world to follow us completely. Therefore, if I could use an example, you can't expect politics to replace the kingdom. You can't expect a governmental system to be adequate to the experience of the kingdom of God, to have a peace and righteousness and holiness that can only come through the kingdom. I was saying earlier to the Antiochian women group that, you know, we live in a time where people are expecting politicians to be messiahs, you know. No politician, no matter what party they're in, is going to cure all the ills of the world. Only Christ did that when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead and gave us the Holy Spirit to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and hopefulness. We should be helping uh, the world to the extent that we can. And then now let us go into the first three days of holiness, of, of Holy Week. What, what hymn there are two hymns there, you know it, fathers, that are always, so what are those hymns? They're, they're eschatological hymns. They're end time hymns. What are they? Behold the bride. Yes? The bridal chamber. The bridal chamber. Open to thee the gates of repentance. That, that is the beginning of Lent. And so those, those gates, that's, but specifically for Holy Week, the first three days of Holy Week, behold, the bridegroom comes at midnight, and I have no wedding garment. And thy wedding, and they, those hymns, thy bridal chamber, but I have, 
we're, we're, we're going through Jesus in the darkness of his, his betrayal and his, resur- and his entrance into Jerusalem. So we're going through the end times directly. This is the world that frets in the darkness. This is the world of Gethsemane. This is the world where, you know, Jesus is betrayed by his friend and all that beautiful thing of Holy Week. So if you want to know uh, maybe historically or reflectively or philosophically or spiritually or piously, what is the end times? Just go through the Holy Week and that will really give you a good sense of what these things are. Jesus spoke plaintively over the destruction of Jerusalem. This was the most religious and righteous place on the earth, and he knew it would become a place of sin and betrayal. And though his hands bled from the nails, they cleaned the sinful heart of man with the detergent of his love. And in this, and remember, John, I want to quote this, and this is the judgment that light has come into the world and man loved darkness more than light because his deeds were evil and he didn't want to come to the light. St. John mentions that all the time even in the epistles. So this is the paradoxical character of finding the kingdom but of knowing the world will never measure up. That is an experience also of the end times. And that goes back to the point of being in the church. In a sense, and this may sound to be an ironic thing, that the more you're in the kingdom, the less less faith, the less trust, the more uncertain you are of the world you live in. It's interesting. The more beautiful and harmonious and ordered the kingdom is, and the more your soul becomes accommodated to that, and a reflection of that, the more difficult it is to enjoy the same things in the same way with the same intensity that you did before. And you shouldn't be afraid of it because you're beginning to leave it. You're beginning to look at the world as a duty rather than as a refuge. And that saves the world from its darkness. That's the saints. They began to see not only Christ in his uncreated light, but every other human being too. Remember St. Seraphim, when his friend looked at him and he saw just he was more brilliant than the sun? And, and then St. Seraphim said, well, you, you're, you look exactly the same way because you couldn't see me in light if you yourself weren't in light. So the people that are getting closer in this eschatological sense that I'm talking about as being the kingdom with us, they start seeing everybody in the world as their potential rather than their, in, in their potential self rather than in their casual self, if I could put it that way, in their pedestrian self, in the self that they present. Or as T.S. Eliot, the poet, said, I prepare faces to meet the faces that I meet. In the Four Quartets, his poem. Pretty soon you see right through that. And we as people become agents of the end times because we're bringing that kingdom in our own person to other people. And when the priest says, peace be unto you, you take it with you. And you give it to other people because they start to find their own centeredness and their own possibilities, their own potentials, their own expansion of love in you. And like St. Seraphim said, well, you're shining in the same light. Wouldn't that be nice to say to somebody? You're shining in the same light. That's, and so this world then, in its, this form I'm talking about, is overcome by the people that love God in the kingdom of God. It's a passage into the kingdom. And that would be the end of my two, pretty much two hours here for this evening on 
Friday. I wanted to go through this specifically and systematically because when we get to uh, mankind at the end times and the great apostasy, if I get that far, and the Antichrist, things like that that the Holy Fathers have mentioned, we will have a reference point that all of this has a historical reality, but that doesn't nearly come as close as our present participation. Hmm. Thank God we have good priests, really, to always present to you the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven.